Thank you. Thank you. All right. Good morning. So I'm going to be talking about the future of infrastructure. And unfortunately, this could be a really short talk. <laughs> I mean, honestly, like, what is there to talk about? We've all heard it before. IT is flat to down. You know, the public cloud is consuming workloads in a way that maybe there's a shift, but there's not a lot of opportunity for the rest of us. The mature markets that are there are being commoditized by open source. I mean, there's this prevailing wisdom that we're kind of like in the armpit of infrastructure. And so not only do I think that that is overly pessimistic, I actually think it's dead wrong. You know, so back in France, every time a king died and a new king was being coronated, they would say, the king is dead, long live the king. And I think a very similar thing is going on here, which is traditional infrastructure as we know it. Yes, it's going through a shift. But I think we're on the cusp of something much bigger, much better, um, much more innovative. And I think that we're actually entering a golden era of infrastructure. And so even though I've heard analysts, I've heard engineers, I've heard architects, I've heard customers talk about how infrastructure is dead, what I want to talk about is how it's just about to come to life in ways that we couldn't imagine even five years ago. So if you'll indulge me, I want to start at something very, very basic and then work my way up. So as we all know, IT is a massive market, like trillion dollar massive, and we all know that it's going through this transformation from the cloud. And when I mean cloud, I mean this kind of idea that you can reimagine software and applications in new ways and deliver it everywhere. And this transformation makes us rethink how we do infrastructure. It's changing the way that we deliver it, the way we sell it. It's changing the way that we build it. But if you look at a macro scale, you've got a $4 trillion market. And if you look at the entirety of cloud, so cloud is currently, if you take public cloud and SaaS, about $220 billion. So you're at the very, very cusp of a transformation. You're about 6% done. Now, the history of computation is marked, it's punctuated by these transformations, right? You have mainframe, client server, you go from client server to cloud, mobile internet of things. And every one of these epochs has at least two things in common. The first one is the market grows drastically. It's actually a very simple thing to see here, right? Because, you know, as you go from, say, mainframe to client server, you went to about, you know, 2 billion endpoints. And then with mobile and Internet of Things, we're talking 200 billion or a trillion. So not only is the customer base every company, hobbyists and home, it's everybody and then going to everything. So not only does the market expand massively, but in almost every epoch, the old guard changes and new entrants come in. And actually, a primary focus of this talk is that I don't think it's ever been easier, ever. And like in the history of computation, for a new entrants to come and add value. And not only that, I would go so far as to say that I actually think new entrants, especially like technical entrants, have a very unfair advantage in this shift. So what I'm going to be talking about is what has changed in infrastructure that's going to kind of usher in this Cambrian explosion of innovation and new entrants. So I think a lot of the dynamics are the cause of a confluence of three trends that feed on each other. And so I'm going to take every one in turn. So the first one is the move from hardware to software. Then we're going to talk about the move from software to services. This is all in the context of infrastructure. And then we're going to talk about the rise of the developer. And as you'll see, each one of these is changing the way that we think, procure, build, consume, and operate infrastructure. Okay, so let me start by talking about the software-defined movement. Okay, I've been grappling with a definition of software-defined ever since it was coined in, in 2009 and the software-defined networking. And I think it's certainly become diluted to the point of being almost useless, right? I mean, people use it for everything. So I've come up with my own definition. The point of me saying this is not to come up with a definition for you. This is my definition for the talk. So the way that I think of something that's software-defined is if you can build functionality in software and deliver it purely in software, to me, it's software-defined. 
So for the purpose of this talk, I'm going to talk about this movement of taking infrastructure functionality that was typically wrapped in sheet metal or tied to an ASIC and built and delivered in software. So this shift is causing the same type of change in infrastructure that we saw in the consumer world in the early 2000s. So in the early 2000s, most digital consumer devices were single function. If you guys remember the GPSs, right, you'd go. I had one that was a watch. You'd go, you'd rent a car, you'd get your Garmin or your Tomcat, you'd put it up there, that was GPS. With the advent of the iPhone, a lot of that changed. And I, I think one of my favorite examples is Waze. I mean, Waze as a company was founded in 2007. It took three rounds of funding, about $67 million. And then when it was acquired by Google in 2013, had 50 million users. So here's a case of a company that only had to focus on software, didn't have to focus on hardware and hardware supply chains, was able to destabilize a massive market. And the big difference was not that Waze knew how to build software better or that people didn't know how to build software. It's the fact that you now had this ubiquitous platform that gave companies reach into every consumer. So I'd argue that the same thing is happening in infrastructure. So traditionally, the way for me, if I was starting a company to get functionality to you as a customer, is I would take sheet metal, I'd wrap it in sheet metal, I'd use standard interfaces, and I would bring it to you. And this is because above the hardware, there was never any standard ubiquitous insertion point. I mean, we're at interop, right? The standard interfaces were like IP. They were Ethernet. They were expansion slots. That's how you would interface. And so the prevailing wisdom in the entire ecosystem was built up around me providing infrastructure technology as hardware. So this has changed pretty dramatically in the last decade. And I say the change, ha change happens in two ways. The first one is we've actually seen standardization in a lot of servers and endpoint stacks at customers, right? Whether there's a hypervisor, Linux or containers, you've got platform as a service, you've got cloud management stacks. So not only are we seeing standardization on servers, these, this infrastructure, the software has evolved to the point where there are abstractions that allow for the consumption of infrastructure. So it's quite possible to build software and to insert at every one of these layers without ever actually bringing a box. Now, so for those of you that don't know, I've got some personal experience with this. So in 2007, I co-founded a company called Nasira, and the whole idea of Nasira was we are going to build you know, L2, L3, L4 through 7 services 100% in software, deliver them in software, and then run them in a hypervisor. So when we founded the company in 2007, every advisor, um, most customers, every investor basically said the only way to ship networking functionality is in a hardware. I mean, I remember very clearly, one of the investors, they invested, they said, you know, and I, I remember he sat down, he's like, Martin, okay, you're a smart kid, you know, I think this is great, but in my heart of hearts, I know that you need to go ahead and wrap this in sheet metal because that's the only way the channel knows how to sell it, that's the only way that you can control the platform, and that's the only way that the customer can consume it. I mean, that was the core story. And if you go forward now, it's been nine years since the founding, you know, not only did we build functionality only in software and deliver it only in software, but this has grown to an enormous business. I mean, so I, was, I ran the networking and security business unit at VMware for four years, and for, or for yeah, for, for, for two years I was actually the GM, I was the CTO before that, and every quarter that I was GM was 100% year-over-year growth, exiting at a half billion dollar run rate business. And this isn't limited to Nasira. That wasn't a special case. And if you look at a lot of the new companies that are coming up, every layer of the stack is being offered infrastructure. And this is the key thing. This isn't an app. This is infrastructure that's being delivered purely in software. So the fact that I, as a startup now, can build functionality in software and ship it only in software means my R&D costs are low and my delivery costs are low. So now I want to talk about another shift that's happening that's getting a little bit less attention, which is the move from software to services. OK, so software is great because R&D costs are low, and the delivery model is much better. I mean, the great thing about software is if I go to a customer, I say, you know what, you can just go ahead and download this. You can try it for 30 days, and then we're going to go ahead and expire the license. I don't have to build a hardware distribution channel. I don't have to carry inventory. I don't have to work with an ODM. It's much, much easier for me to distribute. And this is very well known. I mean, this has played out for decades in the application space. 
But shipping software and operating it remotely is still really hard. It's really hard because every customer environment is totally different. So you have no control of the hardware. It's hard because if there's a problem, you've got to remotely debug. It's hard because you may or may not have skilled operators on the other end. So shipping software is really hard. And because of that, we're seeing a similar shift where to sidestep the thorny issues of deployment and operations, we're seeing companies move to offering infrastructure as service models. So if I offer you infrastructure as a service, I sidestep a lot of these issues. I choose the hardware, so I have my own hardware environment. right? I have the skilled operators on the back end. I do debugging locally. I don't have to deal with multiple versions out in the field. And what's been very interesting to this, there's a, a number of companies, and I think we always go to like, you know, infrastructure as a service as the canonical example. It's far, far broader than that. There are many companies that have generated many billions of dollars in market cap value, you know, many hundreds of millions or billions of dollars in revenue that are delivering infrastructure as a service. They're not even shipping bits. So what does this mean to a new entrant? It means, OK, A, my R&D costs are lower because I can do things purely in software, which let me tell you, 10 years ago, you just couldn't do that. This is new. This is like now. The second thing is, is not only can I build it much quicker, I can deliver it to you in a way that I don't have to build a hardware supply chain and deal with all the inventory. I can get customers to try and buy it beforehand. I've got an insertion point. But then even the post-sales effort of all of the day two ops, all of the manual versions, all of that has become much easier because customers are more and more used to consuming things as a service, whether this is security, whether this is infrastructure, whether this is databases. You know, many of the companies in our portfolio will offer something both as you know, on-premise software and as a service offering, say a database, for example. And if you look at many of them, the actually revenues are split. Half of it's on-prem and half is in service. So this is an acceptable model for consuming, and it makes it much, much easier for a new entrant to enter. OK, so the last trend I want to talk about is what I'm calling the rise of the developers. So this is, I think, one of the most often talked about but least understood trends in the industry. So I want to, I want to spend some time. OK, so what have I said so far? What I've said is, You've got traditional functionality that's been implemented in, in, in hardware and boxes, and that's moving to software. And that software is often installed on an endpoint somewhere. Maybe it's a, an appliance running in a VM. Maybe it's some kernel module. Maybe it's part of a platform as a service where you're implementing a microservice that does things that we've traditionally done in the network. Right? So the examples of these are many. I think at every layer of the stack, you can find things in modern data centers that used to be implemented in hardware. I mean, if you think about a data center 15 years ago, you'd have fault isolation, you'd have discovery, you'd have load balancing, you'd have um, quality of service. You'd have all of that was implemented in hardware, and now you can find analogs in software such that the physical layer has become fairly simple. I mean, it used to be the case that you would use validated designs or the large financials as a way to model how you do your data center. Today, the way that many customers do is they look at the mega data centers or Gen 3 data centers, and these are the canonical cases of having re-implemented core functionality in software. But the implication is far broader than that, which is once you start moving this functionality away from sheet metal, you rip it out of the sheet metal and you put it in software, now it's kind of entering the realm of developers. And so what we've seen over the last decade is that developers have this growing influence on choosing frameworks and a growing influence on in what gets built and deployed. And I think this is singly the biggest transformation we're all going to have to deal with. I think it's also one of the most exciting. And to describe that, let me step back a second and see why. Um, OK, so you out there in your seat, let's say that you decide you know, you've had this idea for a long time, and you're going to go ahead and execute on it. OK, you're going to go you're, do your startup. So you're like, listen, I know I'm going to do this stuff in software. So you, you implement some functionality in software. You heard my talk, so you're like, OK, you know what? I'm going to have a service offering so I don't have to deal like the day two stuff. Like, you're ready to go. It turns out one of the biggest challenges in building a company 
especially a new company in the enterprise infrastructure space, is actually getting the account control and the account traction. It doesn't matter how good your technology is. It doesn't matter how good your service is uh, on the back end. And the reason is, is you know, the enterprise engagement model, sale model, has solidified over the last you know, two decades. And it's a very difficult system to enter. If you think about it, I mean, you've got account reps, hordes of them on every account that have relationships up and down the stack. You've got a very convoluted procurement process. You've got vendor-specific certifications that have been given and have gotten, you know, like, you know, if, if I've certified an operator, you know, a decade ago, and that increased their pay, and that's what they know, like, that's a very valuable thing. And as a new entrant, you never want to invalidate that. You've got analysts who perform a very valuable function. They're actually incredibly influential as you go down market. You've got channels that are trained on specific products. And you know, these channels also carry billions of dollars of incumbent products, so they've got a ton of leverage with them. And then, of course, you've got all of the interfaces and all the operational tools around it. So you're this pipsqueak startup. You show up. You got your kind of cool new functionality in software. But you don't have the sales force. You don't have the channel traction. You don't have the certification. You don't have the interfaces. And this tends to be one of the most expensive parts of creating a startup. Having, having better, having launched multiple products, like it's very, very difficult to break into that. And so if there's one thing that you take away from this talk, it's that the shift to the developer obviates all of that, and in really non-obvious ways. So developers aren't operators, and developers aren't IT and developers are motivated by very different things. I want to make one very clear distinction. I don't think developers are buying centers. They're influencing buying centers, right? I think IT is still going to be around and still going to be an enabler very much so. I think that we're seeing IT evolve into these platform engineering groups that become buying groups. But the types of technology they consume and how they consume are fundamentally different. I mean, I mean, I used to be a developer. It was my first job out of college. I worked on simulations in a... In a um, in a national lab, and I didn't have budget to buy a pencil, you know? Like, basically, what I got was what Core IT gave me. I couldn't even have root in my own machine, and now we've got developers that are bringing in tons of technology, and developers aren't influenced by analysts traditionally. That's not kind of their focus. It's not their aesthetic. You know, they don't have vendor-specific certifications. I mean, and certainly they don't put on their business card. I don't think I know an engineer that has a business card, right? They don't have long-standing relationships with sales reps. They're not part of the procurement process. They're not normally who goes out and has like the big dinner or has the box seat or any of that stuff. These are developers. And what influences them tends to be more technical in nature, right? Traction among other developers, open source, community, um, low friction to adoption, APIs, things that are built for consumption by developers. It's almost like the entire go-to-market and marketing machine that has lasted for 20 years is being upended by a different model. I mean, I would argue that a good open source project will give you more traction with a customer today than you know, any traditional uh, marketing budget beforehand. And so we're seeing over the last five years this kind of Cambrian explosion in developer-centric startups. And I would say, if you look at these, the ideas aren't fundamentally new in many cases. And if you look at these, uh, it's not like there's some core algorithm that's been developed. The reason that you're seeing this, you're, the reason you're seeing this outgrowth of these new companies that are hugely successful, I mean, these companies are hugely successful. They've got global penetration, sometimes overnight, seemingly, the thing that has changed to me is the developer influence has vaulted them into this new position. And so I've put a number of examples up here. There are many more out there. And if you track these, you'll see that we've got these kind of billions of dollars that have been created in these companies going after this, basically subverting traditional go-to-market channels. So the core reason I believe that this is, A, the most exciting time in infrastructure because we're seeing fundamental shifts in the actual technology, and because that technology is being reimagined, and because anybody can reimagine it, and it's anybody's game to enter it. Now, I know you guys have all seen virtual cycle slides before, and 
I, I was kind of contemplating whether to put this in or not, but I truly believe that we're at this, you know, we're at this 6% cusp, right? Like we're just starting to go ahead and kind of vault into the future. And I do think it's going to accelerate. And I do think now is a great time to get out there and do this innovation. I mean, you've got stuff like you got trillions of dollars of stuff that was tied to sheet metal that's being reimagined in software that's being delivered also as services to to, so like R&D costs are lower here, operational costs are lower here, and you don't have to buy into the traditional go-to-market engine anymore as well. It's never been easier to be you. So as my capstone couple of slides, the first thing I'm going to say, um, it's never been more exciting to be here. I don't think there's any bastion in all of infrastructure that is safe from this change. I think everything is fair game. Everything is going to be upended. We're talking trillions of dollars, trillions of dollars of market cap, hundreds of billions of dollars of revenue are up for grabs. I think the whole thing's going to be upseated. I think we're so excited to be here participating in that. And I know nobody knows what the future looks like. I certainly don't. But let me tell you, if you have a good idea, come talk to me. Thanks so much.